a couple of verses here in Romans 8 because I want to deal with you on... Uh, today we're going to talk about integrity. And that is a scriptural word, and it is a scriptural thought. In Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Uh, 8.28. Again, Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good. Now, while those things are working together for good don't mean it's being good for you in the sense of you thinking it's good. Now, that's what we want to deal with uh, in verse 36. As is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. Now, if you put them in connection with verse 28, you go, my goodness, uh, all things are working together for good. Verse 36 says, written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Um, the idea is that just because you get saved don't mean bad things are going to happen. Uh, just because you're not walking in integrity that things aren't bad going to happen. Uh, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. I mean, it would be great if God saved you and nothing ever else go wrong, wouldn't it? It don't happen that way, folks. First Timothy chapter one. We're going to read the book of Job here in second chapter one and find in First Timothy one verse twelve, well eleven, Paul said, "According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. He counted him faithful, so he looked." as it is, at Paul's integrity. I didn't say virtue. I didn't say righteousness. I said integrity. Okay? And there is a difference. Now, tar- turn with me to the chapter. A lot of times people ask me questions that sometimes will break your heart. Sometimes you, you don't know how to answer it. And sometimes you don't want to answer it. i just put it that way. In Job chapter 1, look at verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feareth God and escheweth evil. If anybody should have everything go right, shouldn't he? In accordance with the way he walked, everything should go right. There were born unto him seven sons and three daughters, and keep that in mind. His substance also was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 she-asses, and very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. I mean, just the feed to feed these animals would be incredible. Now verse 4. His sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so when the days of their fast, uh, feasting was gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did God, uh, Job continually. So he was concerned about his household. He was concerned about his sons and daughters that they might be doing something wrong and they might have said something in their heart about God. And you notice it said, curse God in their hearts. Okay? Now there was a day when the sons of God, that's the angelics, came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. So they came up to the frozen deep and spoke because Satan can't come to God. Now that's clear in the Bible. So they came up and they were presenting themselves And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro fro in the earth, from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? So what does God know about him? He knows this about him, okay? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all them uh, that he hath about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. Now, 
this is Satan and God dealing with each other. You understand? They're dealing with each other. Satan's dealing with God. God asked him the first question. Then Satan deals back with him, and he's trying to get it to where he can get to Job. Undoubtedly, God has not let Satan get to Job up to this point because in verse 12, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Now, what is it we know about Job in verse 1? He feared God and escheweth evil. I've had questions asked by uh, an individual, and I can't say who or male or female, I don't want to. But I can say this. What do you say to a young individual that has gotten older that prayed to God that their father would quit abusing them? And God didn't stop it. How do you answer that? Well, there's all kinds of questions. We're not going to deal with that today. We're going to deal with interior today and then maybe why God next week. Verse 12... Uh, 13. No, uh, 12, the end of it. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord, and there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only have escaped. So here we got murderers. Okay? Murderers that have come on the things of Job. All right, next. While he was yet speaking, there came another, also another, and said, The fire of God. The fire of who? Who's he blaming it on? The fire of God? Well, then that tells me something. That in the tribulation, the rod of anger of the Lord, when the, the devil is dealing there, they'll think it's the wrath of God. See what I'm saying? All right, he says, um, verse 16, uh, while he's yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God has fallen upon heaven and hath burnt up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only have escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans have uh, made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and the slain the servants, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So we've got murder, fire of God, thieves and murders. Now verse 18, While they're yet speaking, there came another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters are eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead, and I only am escaped to tell thee. Wind. So you've got murder, fire of God, thieves and murders, the wind. What kind of day was it? Don't you pray to God every day that don't happen to you? Verse 20. Then Job arose, rent his mantle, and shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground, and worshipped, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked, I shall, I, uh, naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Now verse chapter 2. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence camest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Now we got something added. And still he holdeth fast his what? integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. Hmm. Integrity. 
Integrity is simplicity. It's perfection. It's uprightness to do. It's, it's standing there in the good or bad. That's integrity. Okay? Turn with me to 1 Kings. In 1 Kings, now I want to know, can I have integrity and sin? Well, let's see. In 1 Kings, chapter 9. Solomon is going to be king of Israel, or is the king of Israel. Verse 1, It came to pass when Solomon had finished the building of the house of the Lord and the king's house and all Solomon desired, which he was pleased to do. And if you read your Bible, Solomon's very rich. I mean, incredibly rich. But he's the son of David. He came forth out of Bathsheba. And Bathsheba is a stolen woman, another man's wife. Okay? That the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time as he had appeared unto him at Gibeon. And the Lord said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication that thou hast made before me. I have hallowed this, house, hallowed this house which thou hast built to put my name there forever, and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. If and if thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked in what? Say it again. Integrity of what? And in uprise to do according to all that I have commanded thee and will keep my statutes and commandments. Turn to the book of Psalm chapter uh, 26. Psalm 26. Probably if you were judged by man, which the Bible says that you'll be judged of no man if you're in the Lord, they would judge you probably out of the will of God because you don't go and establish religion. They would say that your integrity has fallen short because that you don't believe what the forefathers and your grandma and grandpa or somebody else believed. You've separated yourself and you go to a Bible study church. Okay? Psalm 26. Look with me at verse 1. Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in thee, in the Lord. Therefore, I shall not slide. Turn with me to uh, 2 Samuel, chapter 12. And 2 Samuel 12 is the story of Bathsheba. It is the basis of it afterwards. Uh, obviously, uh, chapter 11 is about Bathsheba. Bathsheba was Uriah the Hittite's wife. David stole her, committed adultery with her, and had Uriah killed. He, uh, he's king of Israel. He can do whatever he wants. Verse 1, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. And he came unto him. Nathan's a prophet. And said unto him, There were two men in one city, one, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he brought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with her children. It did, not, it did eat of his own meat and drink of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. I mean, this animal is a pet. Let's just get it right. It would be like your dog, okay? And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was coming to him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. Boy, don't you know that make you mad? This guy's got herds of animals, and he comes over, Maybe you're a land cropper on his land or whatever. Comes over and gets your lamb, the only one you got, 
and takes and kills that lamb. Okay? And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. Woo. Okay? And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, that man that doeth this thing, or hath done this thing, shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he had done this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Wow. Recognize conviction? Do you realize the conviction in Acts 9 when the Lord appeared to Paul? Saul was trying to kill people that believed Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Hmm. I would say there's conviction that day, wouldn't you? He said, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over Israel, and delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. Now think about this. Who put him in office? Sure enough. Who gave him everything? God did. Why did you take her? If you wanted her, pray. And eventually you'd have got her anyway, probably. Did you ever think about that? Your rock could have been killed in battle anyway. All things work together. But it works together for someone that loved God. But now watch this. And so you say, well, this man is a rotten individual. Well, let's, let's check some things out. Look in Psalm, since you're in Psalm close there, Psalm 51. And if you've got a marker, you could mark this is the relationship. This is the chapter in Psalm where David is crying this. In Psalm 51. And I, I meant for you to apologize. I should have, I'll just read it to you. In Psalm 51, while I'm here, I'll read it. Uh, Psalm 51, look with me in verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the, unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly with, uh, from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. David never forgot. He lost a child over this. The child that Bathsheba was conceived with died. And he watched it. And he cried and lamented before the child died. But when the child died, he cleared it up. You know why? Because he knew why the child died. Okay? Then turn with me to uh, Psalm 20. There are some things you do in life that you'll never forget. In Psalm 26, verse 11, But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity, redeem me, and be merciful unto me. Now this is the man that is going to take Bathsheba. Now, turn with me to Acts 13. I hear people say all the time, I've just done some things I don't think God could forgive me for. Then you don't see the mercy and kindness of God. It is unmistakable, the kindness of God. In Acts 13, look with me in verse 22. Now, did the people choose Saul, king of Israel, because he was a head and shoulders above all men? It's a looking thing. It's like Lot. He looked at the green over in Sodom and Gomorrah. Just because it looks good don't mean things are right. Look around you in religion. 
Religion looks good. It looks like it's growing. It looks like things are going sometimes. And then you go to First Timothy, and he said, great gain is godliness is what they think. He said, from such withdrawal. People say, well, how could a ministry or how could God be working in small numbers? Ask them on the ark. How many people got on the ark? How many people do you think is on the ark? Millions. How do you think? Because they multiplied. Okay? Now, in Acts 13, how much does God know from before the foundation of the world? All things, and there is nothing hid. Okay? So when there came a time for this man David to be born and live his life, in that lifetime did he know that he would appoint him? And he had a reason. So he would appoint him as king of Israel because of Saul's failure to do exactly what he told him to do. Saul was told to go over in the country, kill everything. I'm talking about it said, kill man, woman, infant, sucklings, and all animals. Now that's a heck of a command to do from God. You, you, it'd be like you'd say... Are you sure this is God speaking to me? You want me to kill the babies and the sucklings, the infants? Yes, want them all killed. All right. As they're being killed, they're praying not to die. When they were loading the Jews into the train, and separated their children from the parents, and the children probably behind the fence watching their parents get into the, the train, there's praying going on. And they got delivered anyway. They were burnt. And the children, some of them lived and some of them didn't. They went to camps and started. Were they praying? They didn't got answer. work together. Folks, there's reasons why God don't answer. The Word of God has always been there for man to read. And God's Word is always good. But in God's Word it said, train up a child in the way he shall go. How many People are righteous. Keep that in mind. In Acts 13, 22, And when he had removed him, that Saul of Tars, uh, assist, Saul did not do what God told him. He did not kill. And Samuel went and told him, just like Nathan went and told David, and verse 22, when he had removed him, he raised up David the son, uh, to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. And people say, well, that's because he wouldn't bow his knee to an idol. You're not going to find that verse, but you're going to find out why he wouldn't bow his knee to an idol. Why? He said, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill how much of my will? All of my will. Okay? Now, Turn to Romans chapter 3. Very familiar verse. Let's see what happens here in verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Whoa, well then, man, he ain't got much to choose from, has he? Think about God's decision to choose you, and it's based on Romans 3.23. It's based on Psalm 14. He said, look down from heaven, look at men, they're all going away from you. So, I mean, it ain't like, it's like when the, uh, the Pharisees said, why do your master eat with publicans and sinners? There ain't nobody else to eat with. Nobody else to eat with. They're all publicans and sin and come show the glory of God. Somebody that thinks that he's better than someone else hasn't got what God actually did. He looked at you when you were ungodly sinner and enemy, Romans chapter 5, 6, 8, and 10. While he was dying, you're a sinner. While he was dying, you're ungodly. While he was dying, you're a sinner, ungodly, and no use of God unless he does something. But yet we have the Ephesian letter. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. 
Third verse is in his Bible. You better be thankful it's there. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship. Well, the four is connecting, verse 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Why? If God looks at your works, you're unrighteous. If He looks at your works, you're not good. If He looks at you the way you are, He knows what it says in Romans 7. Paul said, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. But the integrity is in the heart. Romans chapter 7, verse 24, wretched man that I am, who should deliver me from this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I serve the law of God. Members of the law of sin and death. Now, in accordance with verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So God ordained a time when we could walk in His good works. And God's going to check the integrity of your heart and see if you'll stick with it. He said He counted me faithful. He counted me faithful. Now watch. Turn to 2 Corinthians 4. You know, people come and go through the Bible study I have no idea where they go, and I don't know whether they believe or not believe. That's up to them. That's between God. But there is integrity involved, whether they stick with the faith. And that's something, how would I know? That would be between them and God. All I can do is teach you the faith. All I can do is show you that there was a faith that was better than yours long before you were born. And that faith is what Paul was judged on. God judged the integrity of Paul's heart of whether he'd keep the faith. And he counted me faithful. Okay? In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, you know, it's hard to keep the faith if you don't know what it is. The God of this world blinds people so they don't know the faith of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure. What is that? Verse nine, uh, 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Go back to verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them or lost, in whom the gods were blind in the minds of them which believe not, lest the glory, light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Back to verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our heart. This is somebody that let the light in. This is somebody that's willing to believe that God is able. This is somebody that believes that God did. Thus, in verse 7, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We're not perfect. We're sinful. David was sinful. We are perfect in Christ, not in the body. Philippians gives you both accounts of this in chapter 3. We are perfect in Christ, sinful in body. We Our mind is to stay on the faith. Our mind is to give other people the truth of God, not what we are. Said, well, are you a good example? The best example I ever heard was somebody that says, Jesus Christ died for my sins according to the Scripture and was buried and rose again the third day. I am saved and sealed, glorified and justified, and nothing can take it away. That's the greatest witness you will ever hear. Why? Because he didn't do anything to get it. Now, watch. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence. God, not of us. Turn to Romans 12. Romans 12. Oh, I listen to things. I read things and I go, my goodness. What in this world? I got a brochure given to me from a man that's got radio programs all over the place, and you ought to hear some of the things he says. <laughs> it just ain't worth talking about. Romans 12 1. I beseech you, brethren. By the therefore, brethren, therefore connecting chapter 11, 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Do you know that Saul, the Apostle Paul, presented his body to the Lord blind? I thank God for Ronnie being here. He hears the truth every time he comes in. And you know what? He ain't got no idea what any of us look like. And he can like us whether he has ever seen us or not. Do you ever think about that? Most of your emotions are based on what you see. You couldn't say that about Ronnie. He hears. He probably has a more sensitive hearing about things than you think. Amazing, isn't it? Paul laid on the ground there, Saul, and he's blind. And the Lord said, Rise. Go into the city and it will be told thee what thou must do. Hmm. Verse 2. Be not conformed to this world. The reason you're dressed the way you are and the reason you're driving what you do, the reason you got the house, is that you conform to the world. You build a new house, you build a pattern that somebody had in their mind. You dress because of the latest fashions, maybe. Put makeup on or comb your hair. It's like Bonnie gets up in the morning, or my Molly, and she don't care what her hair looks like. <laughs> this morning, it was everywhere. Sticking up. She had pawpaw hair. My hair stands up in the back sometimes when I sleep. And she didn't care a bit. She was ready to play. There's some people who wouldn't get out of their house till they clean up, man. You people... Oh, Brother Morris, I knew him. You always saw him dressed up. I seen him come out in the studio, look like a bear hit him. His hair was sticking all up, house shoes on, no socks, coughing and hacking. And Everybody who's seen him at a conference like that wouldn't listen, would they? <laughs> come as you are when you get up. It'd be our luck. We'd have new visitors. <laughs> We're not going to be impressed. I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, it's Friday comes every once in a while. Uh, right, verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So you got a mind, and you got the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ can teach your mind what the will of God is. I don't know what the time say. I don't know what the will of God is. I don't know what the will of God is. We read. Paul's got the will of God in Romans through five Lehman. The will is for you to be saved. Come to the knowledge of the truth. The will of God is. First Thessalonians. There's a lots of verses on the will of God. Say, well, I don't know what the will of God is. It's your Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You got taught high school, grammar school. You got taught education. Now maybe it's a time in your life when you get taught by the Word of God. And I'll bet you when you get taught by the Word of God, you're going to see the foolishness of this world. It made it any better. And since I have a boy, it's got worse. Why can't they? And I hear this all the time. The cure, cure cancer. How many years does it take? There's big money in it. Those people that are curing, trying to get the cure for cancer, if they get the cure, they're out of a job. The people that supply the drugs, they're out of a job. When Mrs. Russell got healed, I bet you half or more of that was fortitude. She wanted to stay around. She did have a lovely set of hair when she came out of it. But I believe God took care of her. Because we all needed her and Brother Russell needed her. She's to me like the mother of camp. 
That's what I always thought of her. She was like the mother of camp, Bible camp. Uh, when I went to see her, there's Brother Russell delivering the garbage. There's Mrs. Russell cooking. And I loved it. That was my July fest. I enjoyed it very much. I miss it. Verse 12, uh, 2, so that you may prove what is an acceptable and perfect will of God. So you knew, don't you? Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, I apologize, Ephesians 5, not 2. Ephesians chapter 5. Think of how little is known about the Bible in America. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 7. Be not ye partakers with them. Well, look at this. Verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things, well, let's go back. Verse 1. I give you those words so I can end. we can see what it's saying. Verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Walk in love as Christ also loved us, and have himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not once be named among the saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man. Wait a minute. How many of you have ever wanted more than you had? The rest of you are liars. <laughs> Covetousness is what? Who is an idolater? Well, folks, now when Moses, they had a god, and they wanted more, another god. Hmm. <clears throat> Hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God? Now, he made emphasis here of two kingdoms. Colossians chapter 1 says, Who hath translated us into the kingdom of Christ. The kingdom of Christ is different than the kingdom of God. Now, watch this. Let no man deceive you words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. So, undoubtedly, five and four are children of what? Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are the light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, in what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Rather, reprove them, for it's a shame even to speak of things which are done of them in secret, but all things are reproved, are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is the light shined in you, if you know the gospel. If you've trusted the gospel, the light shined in you. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, and 7. It's a treasure. And he's telling you how to walk. <clears throat> now turn to Proverbs 19. In Proverbs 19. Now, this is a thought for the preachers in the world. They don't believe this. Proverbs 19.1 Better is the poor that walketh in his integrity than he that is perverse in his lips and is a fool. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and snare, a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. Notice the faith. And pierced, them through with, uh, pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow up. Righteousness, goodness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Hmm. Second Timothy chapter 4. Now this man Paul 
says something here, and we're going to check back in his writings to see what he did to be saying this. He's either a braggart or he's actually done it. Now watch. Timothy 4, verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered. Now he's in prison. Matches up with the Ephesian letter and the, the bonds of Acts 28 and on and on the chain. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. Uh, a good fight is when you don't hit below the belt. A good fight is uh, you do according to the rules. You fight legally. Uh, the difference between boxing and fighting is a street fight. You kick, gouge, bite, and stick and shoot. In a boxing match, there's legalities you have to follow. It's a good fight. He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Now, that's what the Lord saw in Paul's integrity of his heart. That's what he saw in David. Yes, he knew David would take Bathsheba. Yes, he knew he would do what he did to Uriah the Hittite. Yes, he knew he'd number. The devil moved David to number. It angered those kind of things. Yes, he knew all of that. But he looked at him and he said, He's a man after my own heart. He'll do all my will. Okay? Thus he said, His finishing. He said, I have kept the faith. He said in Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy 1 4, he said it'd be a time, no, 1 Timothy 4 1, the time would be they'd depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing doctrines and uh, seducing uh, spirits and uh, get it right. Seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. All right. Now watch. He says in Philippians chapter three and get Proverbs twenty. Proverbs twenty. In Proverbs chapter twenty, verse seven. The just man walketh in his integrity, and here's what it won't. His children are blessed after him. His children are blessed after him. Okay? Some knowledge from this. How important it is for us to do what Paul says. Okay? In Philippians chapter 3, he looks at verse. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinketh he have where he might trust in the flesh, I am more. Circumcised the day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, is touching the law of Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteous, which is in the law of blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. That would be the mind of Christ. For whom I suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung. Sounds like Paul's life similar to Job one day. He lost. But he count them as what? How many of you count your old religion as dung? In front of them. <laughs> he said, I'm... The Apostle Gentiles, I magnify my office. Do you magnify your Lord? Or do you politically correct? You're going word, by the way, politically correct. Whatever. For I have suffered the loss of all things to count them a dung that I may win Christ. The winning Christ to the people around him. Winning the approval. They might see him as he is. Not what they think he is. Well, folks, in uh, Acts chapter 19 and uh, other places in Ephesians, he went before Mars Hill and he waited in them. He stood before them and didn't make friends, man. Acts 13, he didn't make friends. They waxed bold when they said, he said, for the word of God first be spoken to you. But see, you put it far from me. Hence we turn to the who? Oh, my God. The Gentiles. You have a Gentile passing the Bible, and they look at you and go, huh? Say, well, who do you buy? I thought of Peter. Really? Peter won't let you go to heaven. You can't go to heaven, Peter. Because Peter wasn't looking to go to heaven. He was preaching about the earth. What? In 
2 Corinthians. Now, did he say, just one more verse in Philippians 3. Verse 9, and be found in him not having mine own what? Now, if you ain't called he calls children, his children will be blessed. Turn with me to Corinthians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 5 said, Walk ye as dear children. Now that's got a meaning, dear children. They were Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto children, be ye also enlarged. 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship have righteous with unrighteous? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God? And that's First Corinthians chapter 6. You know what? No, you're not your body with Christ. You're, the temple of God is the body of a believer that has trusted Jesus Christ. In their heart, in their mind, they believe that they are sealed and saved. And they have a treasure. And that vessel can except in what Christ did. Watch this. He said, We have the temple of God with idols, for you are the temple of the living God, as God I will dwell in and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Hmm. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> Look with me. In verse... I'm having a cut in here. Verse 10, We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honorable, but we are despised. He did this for the believers that would believe. Now, say verse 15. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be your followers of me. We already read Ephesians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 11. Well, if you ain't got these verses marked or thought about, you ought to. you got to follow somebody. You know, if you don't follow something, you'll fall for anything. You got a cable-driven ferry across the river. And if you're riding on that thing, you got your car or your bike or whatever, and you're on that ferry, you they got a little outboard motor and a cable. And you're put 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 putting along that cable, and you look at that cable, and you think, "I wonder what happens if thing breaks." Well, you'd have a little put put, but it probably wouldn't handle the river. But I've been on and didn't have a motor. They pulled it with their hand, and I, yeah, that cable. We're gonna have a Missouri boat ride here in a minute. If that cable breaks, we're going down the river, and I mean, we're getting on with it. And you'd be sitting there in your car going down the river, not knowing where that thing's gonna hit. I think that's the way most people are. They're going on a river ride and they don't know where they're going to end up. Folks, I don't want to know what's going to happen. I want to be in the presence of God Almighty forever. I want to know that He will not, I want to know that He'll never leave me and that He has it all worked out. And bless your soul, I've got it in power. And He has given to the Father which has given me instruction from the Father. Now watch this. First Thessalonians, look with me in verse 11. He says, As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. And instructs his children, ain't no doubt. Now, look in Proverbs 11. I'll shut up. Proverbs 11. Well, i got a couple more verses. I lied. In Proverbs 11, 
verse 1. A false balance is an abomination of the Lord. Just wait is this delight. Think of how many crooks there are in the world. They'll drill out the weights on us. So uh, you get more than you get. Verse 2. When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. That's the book of Job. In all that Job was, he still had pride. All that you are, you still have pride because you still like to brag. Verse 3, the integrity of the upright shall guide you. Take a little time and sit down with the Lord this week and let Him talk to you. Open your Bible. Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord in thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. Those are incredible verses. Romans 8. Let's let Him direct our paths. In Romans 8. In Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> verse 33. No, 31. What should we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. And Jesus prayed many times. But two distinct prayers are, Father, if it be thy will, pastor, but nevertheless not my will, but thy will be done. Another, it was... I commend my And the third one was, it's finished. In the I told you, but I wish on not If they put a tombstone, they said he kept the faith. I pray to God for that every day. Why? The faith of the Lord Christ is far being forgotten. They were right talking about what they did for the Lord. You ain't done nothing for the Lord. You couldn't do anything to please Him anyway. You never did anything of what the Lord Jesus Christ did. His faith went to Calvary and died for your sins. Went down. His soul left His body. Went down into hell. Spent three days in hell. When He came up, God justified you, forgave you, and glorified you. And it's available to you every day that you're living. There are two times in your life when you can't get saved. Two times. One, if you die without the Lord. And two, if the tied up goes out before you die and you didn't take it. Then you're hurt. You take your last breath, you're not saved, you're hurt. You're breathing today, and if you're not saved, and the body's caught up, you're hurt. And God says so. But all other times, it's the will of God for you to be saved. There's nothing that has to be done. It's finished. It is to believe. Just trust what God has done, and take of your heart that He saved you. Romans 8, 36, says it written for that to be killed all the day long. Well, yeah, verse 33, he shall be to the charge of God's living. Who is he that condemned it? Or for the inherent people working against you? There are things working against you. But verse 36, 30, and all these things are more than conquered through him. So those things that you read, aren't you read 31 through 39 today? And look at those things that are going to happen to you as a believer. And it's like that.